Hey, good morning, everybody. Michael back at you guys with a special guest, episode two, Military to Civilian Life podcast. We got Orlando with me, and uh, I'm not going to steal the shine of you, so I just want you to go ahead and introduce yourself, if you don't mind, and, and share a little bit about your uh, journey to the military, you know, how you started off, what got you going, and just whatever else you want to touch on at first. Okay, well, uh, as previously stated, good morning. You know, my name's uh, Orlando Silva. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, in high school, senior year, I knew that uh, not that I didn't have the grades, I didn't have the discipline to go to college. And, uh, you know, the, the Brooklyn of the 80s was not a good environment, and uh, I didn't want to become a product of it. So uh, senior year, beginning of senior year, I went to the recruiting station, and uh, at that time, the Army was the only one doing contraction. That our, uh, the Navy and everyone else wasn't. So the Army essentially gave me a uh, contract in writing, you know, basic training, AIT, uh, jump school, and then I was going to be a 44 Bravo, which doesn't exist anymore. I think it's a 91X now. Okay. Um, back then it was uh, metal work, welded, because I welded in high school. So I graduated high school. Basic training at Fort Dix, which is closed now. It's, it's a federal pen. Uh, AIT at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Went to jump school and then I arrived to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, was uh, right around March of 1989. Okay. So the time go when you joined the military, how how the time go by for you? I mean, how long did you end up serving for when it was all said and done? And then you know compare your time when you were like a private junior enlisted and then obviously you, I know you told me you did a long time but I'll let you touch on that uh yeah. how was your time in the service it was uh definitely had its ups and downs uh you know I, I wind up doing 32 years altogether retiring as a command sergeant major and uh the, the military of the, the the late 80s it was uh different as well you know they were still using Vietnam era TTPs um the training was just excruciating um, and you know I did seven years on Fort Bragg I went from one to sergeant promotable and uh, I, I've gone as far as I can go in the unit I had deployed with them you know went to Hong there's a storm to the shield uh, up did a uphold democracy in Haiti and then went to Florida for the hurricane cleanup for Andrew did a humanitarian mission. And at that time, when, when you stay in a unit that long, it's like you're part of a bunch. <laughs> serious, you know, you don't get all the schools you needed. So right around 95, I made a decision. I, you know, I got to get out of here before Brad went to Korea. And, uh, you know, saw a lot of the, the you know, regular army. I wouldn't say we're all regular army, but um, the non-airborne side. Okay. You know, armor unit, um, Battalion Sergeant Major at the time, who became a good friend of mine, he said, look, you've done enough time on the line, I need you in S3. So I was able to learn how, as an assistant S3, how a battalion, support battalion operates. Okay. Um, enjoyed it, had fun, but you know, when, when you're in the Fort Bragg Mafia, they send you back. So a year later, <laughs> I to Fort Bragg and began my next seven years, uh, where I started in the 82nd. Oxford uh, Company, unit doesn't no longer exist. Okay. I mean, battalion in the 82nd, you know, section sergeant. I did platoon sergeant. Uh, was a first sergeant as a sergeant, as a newly promoted sergeant, first class was a first sergeant. And uh, did that for seven months. And then again, S3, I did brigade, uh, the DISCOM, if you remember that, uh, division support command, S3. And uh, and then moved again after seven years. And then this time I went to Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland as an AIC instructor. Did you deploy when you went back to uh, Fort Bragg for your second stint? Did you get a couple more deployments in? Yes, in the 82nd, I wound up going to uh, OIF-2. Okay. It was only there 90 days. I was uh, injured in a vehicle accident in CSS Kenya. Okay. Um, and they had to get sent back early. So essentially the whole 2004 was in physical therapy and the army deciding whether they were going to put me out medically or not. Okay. What happened after you went to go do a uh, AIT instructor at Aberdeen? Did you go back to Bragg? Yeah, no, no. As soon as I got to Aberdeen, I made the 
2004 master's time list. Okay. And uh, they tried to keep me there as an AIT instructor. And uh, and I told them not. I said, I told them not. You know, a year's enough, plus I'm dual military. And then my wife at the time was in Korea. Okay. Oh, you guys were you guys were going back and forth. One was gone, then one comes home. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard that story too many times, man. I was at Campbell, and you know, 101st, 82nd, the best robbery in the military, right? So we dealt with the same thing. People would think they go to Korea for a year and then come right back to Campbell, man. I couldn't get away from it, so. Oh, well. They did come up, though. They did try to uh, send me back to Fort Bragg, and at that time, I was still unsure if I wanted to jump again because of my – it was a calf injury. And uh, I didn't want to risk the chance, so we, we went to drum. Okay. Um, got to Fort Drum in 2005, and they made me the HAC first start, second brigade, 210 BSB. Did that for a year. And right before we were supposed to deploy, the first song from Bravo Company got hurt or something. Couldn't deploy, so the battalion star made you moved me to Bravo and uh, took them forward. We did 15 months. Deployed. Yeah, yeah, I was on one of those trips. I was, uh, we were supposed to do 15 and got cut to 13 and a half, man. We thought we hit Christmas early, you know. Yeah. That was a lot, it was a long time, man. 15 months. I mean, it is, it is, uh, you know, and then being a first sergeant stateside, it's actually, at least for me, it, it was easy being a first sergeant stateside because, um, you know, no, no, I wouldn't say that. In combat, it's easier to be a first sergeant. Let me change that because I knew where all hundred. Yeah were 24 I knew where all 120 of my soldiers were at 24 7. stateside I, I didn't know it was <laughs> sometimes you're gonna get calls on the weekend hey we got a, we got someone at the gate hey we got someone at the MP that you're not getting that overseas you got everyone you know it's a little bit easier I guess to manage I would say yeah you're probably right on that 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 note yeah. um so after that how many more years did you serve before you hit your 32 because you're already up to master sergeant so you had you made sergeant major at some point and yeah, I left Fort Drum and then returned back to Fort Bragg in uh, it was February 2008. Okay. That time, the unit that I reported to, which was the 108th Air Defense Artillery Brigade, um, as soon as I got there, brigade saw me just like, uh, hey, you know, we're going to Ramadi, get ready, so forth and so on. And I'm like, uh, hey, CSM, I just got back, you know, and he was. You like, get no dwell time? Oh, they didn't even care about that at 82nd, huh? Um, no, th this was outside of the 82nd realm. If okay. it was 82nd, you know, it takes a GO to weigh that. Okay. The 82nd, I think, has a GO on retainer at that time to sign okay. off waivers. But the brigade sergeant major, he uh, became a friend of mine as well afterwards, and he said, oh, you just got back. I said, yeah, for how long? I said, 15 months. And when did you get back? I said, you know, November of last year. And uh, and I said, I just need to know if I am going because I am this August, I hit 20. I said, I'm dual military. You know, I've been in Iraq twice. My wife's been in Afghanistan twice. And we got two teenagers, you know, so I, I can't do that again. And I told them, I said, look, we, you know, a lot of people don't mind deploying. Um, but, you know, like I know everybody that deploys, deploys, but really doesn't. You, know, you got people that, you know, support roles and things. And that's fine because we need that. But, you know, the, the brigade lost 53 during that. Point. Wow, and I lost my wow. and I just wasn't ready to do that again. So he said, "Hey, look, no problem. You're going to stay here at rear deep, so, uh, rear provisional, meaning more rear than forward." And he left me as the brigade rear deep. Uh, they came back, um, and then he made me his first arm. So uh, altogether, I stayed a master sergeant essentially for ten years. I was in okay. one of those. Places Moises, you know, uh, welders don't get promoted mostly past sergeant first class. The right. fact that he saw in first class and made master sergeant, I thought it was over. Okay. Um, stayed with them with the air defense unit, stayed with them for four years, and then they sent me back to Korea as a first sergeant again. So keep in mind, out of the 10 years, I was a first sergeant six months. Okay. And uh, went to Korea, they made me a first sergeant again, and, and uh, I was retiring. 2004. 2013 November, I came back to Fort Bragg. They put me in the 82nd again. Um, put me in 3rd Brigade this time. I arrived at Brigade Sergeant Major, you know, uh, one of those guys. You know, 
uh, hey, you know, we got FSCs. I need a first song. I said, see, I said, I can't do it. He can't do it. I said, I just finished my something. I'm in the first song. Well, and he's looking at, he hadn't looked at my ERB. I think they call it something else now. And uh, he was like, oh, wow. Yeah, check it out real quick. Go to S3. Uh, showed up to S3. Was the battalion ops sergeant for 82nd BSB. Star Brigade. Two months later, the song Major List comes out. And uh, I was still retiring. This was 2014. I was like, you know, I'm done. I have 25 years in at the time. Um, and then by that time, both kids went out the house. My wife, like I said, was in the Army also. And she was like, hey, man, you know, it's just us. We a thing. So uh, that August, I reported to Fort Bliss. So I made the academy class 66. And so I made the academy for the, only, for the viewers out there and for those who have future ambitions it's 11 months and uh all that bliss all all on on uh, so i don't know how long it was that's, that's a long time the resident course a lot of people um, I, i've heard you know a lot of people thought it was a waste of time and they'd rather do non-res um for me i'm a people person so those 11 months in school you know uh benefited because i got to meet every future Battalion Sergeant Major support. You know, most of my classmates now, as a matter of fact, my, my classmates are running for me. Quartermaster, Ordnance, and Transportation Sergeant Majors are all my classmates. How many people did you have in your class, roughly? 470 something. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, and then international students in there as well. And it's real strategic learning. It's just, it, it, you know, people say it's a waste of time, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner. So I learned a lot about how the Army operates. You know, at that high level, and uh, was selected for a battalion in the conventional army, and then was selected for seven special forces group, and uh, wasn't real too keen on going soft and that kind of stuff. And uh, I asked uh, well, our major branch, you know, which battalion am I getting regular? Army? We don't know yet, because that's how they do us. You know, we don't know yet. You know, yeah, he comes up and. Uh, you know, but I knew I was going to seventh group. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna take the poison that I know versus what I know. Okay. So they yeah, graduated the academy that July or June of 2016 and shot me right back to Fort Bragg. And then I was an ops star major in the uh, first special forces command, 528 Special Operations Sustainment Brigade. I was there for like a year. And uh, my battalion opened up in June 17, and I drove down from Bragg to Edgar Air Force Base and, and passed the guide on uh, with my predecessor, who's now the HRC Sergeant Major at Knox. And, uh, and, and then there it began, you know, as, as a GSB uh, group support Sergeant Major and, 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 and Seven Special Forces Group, which I had never been in before. I knew a lot of guys that went SF, uh, but I had never been in that environment before. so. You know, I had to swallow certain things because it's about support there. You know, it, it, the conventional army is good, but not in that environment. Yeah. You know, so, you know, there's a standard and then there's maximum and then there's minimum. So I had to brace myself for, for minimum standards, but they're still standard. Right. I had to be able to accept that, you know, uh, operational, you know, you you hear the, the, the I don't know you heard, they, they have... Uh, relaxed grooming standards, no such thing. It's operational or non-operational. Yeah. Okay. Boy, X amount of days prior to you can grow something like you have. Right. Yeah. They got they got something way different than what you were probably used to. What we all were used to in the regular side, right? Like oh, yeah. yeah, totally different. You know, um, first name basis sometimes even like you know stuff. I mean, maybe for maybe on the teams, but you would know. Yeah, peer to peer. Um, you know. It, it, Sergeant Major was a Sergeant Major. You know, everybody referred to me as that or CSM, and I was cool with that. Um, my, you know, peer to peer, when you go to the academy, um, that's what you call yourself. Hey, Michael, you and my classmate are in school. Hey, Michael, in the academy, they don't call each other by this first name. So it surprised me when I went out into the Army and I introduced myself to other Sergeant Majors. Hey, Orlando, how you doing? And they're looking at me sideways. I know you went to the same school I went to. <laughs> Um, oh so, man, and they'd introduce himself. Hey, I'm Sergeant Major Jones, right? Yeah. Something like that. Like, hold on. Just, just around. I could see if there was an outside entity, but no, it's all E9s there. And, and I don't know. Um, so it was awful. I had to swallow certain things, but uh, I, I will tell you in those two years, it was probably the, 
the best profession because I actually got to support a real mission versus okay. vicious in JRTC and MTC. Right, right. You know what I mean? So, so what were you at when you got done with those two years, like 27 years in? No, 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 no. When I, uh, when I passed the guide on in 19, I was at 31. So before you pass a guide on, did you know you were going to get out the military? Did you know you're like, I'm, I'm, it's my time? Yes, I was at mandatory because while I was in the academy, the, the RCP changed from 32 to 30. Okay. So the, the previous SMA daily um, fast tracker throughout his entire career, you know, he uh, believed in, you know, people who were ready to be promoted ahead of their peers and things like that. And, and, and you did at that time have a lot of my peers out there going from ops on major positions, ops on major positions and not battalion CSM positions. Because back then you didn't, now it's all in. Back then you cannot out. You can decline CSM every year. Okay. You stay at SGM for the rest of your time until you hit 32. And a lot of them did that. So Just stay on forced, staff. Yeah. You forced other Sergeant Majors to, you know, I know one who was a battalion Sergeant Major three times before he even got a brigade. By choice or? No, no, there's no choice. Just, hey, you're going here, you're going here, you're going here. Our major branch that tells you, hey, you go in here, and if you don't go, you got six months to be out. That's the way they do it. Yeah, they, uh, they, they give it to you one or the other. That's So did you know what you wanted to do when you got – did your wife get out of the military before you, you said? No, 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 no. She retired a year after me, Halloween day. Uh, okay. Okay, so when you when you were getting ready to go out the door, did you know what you wanted to do when you got out the military? Did you have any mentors? I mean, obviously you're – command sergeant major at that point so i mean you probably talking with other sergeant majors and full birds and all these these high grade field officers was anyone there talking to you about hey hey orlando you know what you're gonna do when you get out was anyone like sort of prying at you like that or not really yeah no i've been in my case was a little bit different so you know i've actually been retiring in my mind mentally since i hit 20 years so at 20 years i had a linkedin account at 20 years, you know, I was taking college, you know, uh, talking to people that had retired. I wasn't too familiar with the VA system. I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew more of what I didn't want to do. You know, okay. Anything that entailed nights, weekends, and overtime, I knew, you know, that I didn't want to be a part of. And, and there's a lot of great positions out there paying six figures, but yeah, you're going to work for it. Most definitely. Yeah. Or are you going to deploy again as a civilian for it, right? Contractor, you know, you're going to make good money, but you're right over there without the uniform on. So did, um, was, did you guys ever talk about like, uh, you know, make sure you guys get this stuff in your medical records. You know, did anyone tell you that when you were coming up, uh, was that, was that something that was talked about or frowned upon or what was, what was your uh, take on that? Yeah. Well, you know, especially, at, at, at that time for a brag. Sick call was one of those things that was for serious things. Right. And you, you, you caught hell. Um, yeah. And, and by the time I hit 20 years in, my medical records uh, were not as fat as everybody else's. You know, I, I, I stayed pretty pretty much healthy a lot now. Yeah, I had injuries, serious ones from, from jumping. Um, shoulder injury and back and you know things like that. So at 20 years, um, what I started doing was anything that was an issue, it wasn't more so of uh, getting, you know, getting out of anything. It was more so get it looked at and what's the treatment. So everybody what made you turn that switch on at 20 years? Um, because at, after 20, you you essentially can get out whenever you want. See what when the, from one to twenty, and that's what I tell everybody from one to twenty. You owe the army because you know once you hit twelve, you hit you hit uh, in death. Okay. Well, now you're locked in for twenty. So if you decide to go past twenty, and that's where the preparation needs to come in because you can be out at any time. You know the army is not going to, especially if you're a senior and you mess up. You know um, your time. Right. Or you know get out, or, or or you know, or you can drop it whenever you want. So I had already started mentally. You know. I, I had LinkedIn accounts, 
you know, already done and, and, and things like that. And I wind up, you know, mentors and people that got out. I, I know I'm a people person, so I know, I know a lot. If I don't know them, my wife knows them, you know. Okay. A lot of farm majors and people that, you know, I'm in the level farm majors right now that I serve with who are family. Okay. So, yeah, definitely. I did talk to people. Um, but you, you don't know what you don't know. Most definitely. Everything changes every year. So, you know, once I passed the guide on, you know, I did the whole ACAP thing like everyone else. And then, uh, then I did tap twice. I did a regular tap. And I did executive tap. The executive tap was more so of a facilitated discussion about what to do. And they covered some good things, but I don't think they got in depth. Uh, like they did at the tap that I attended with Pride, that were ECLC and stuff like that. You were at Bragg when you were at Eglin? I, I was on Eglin. I did Eglin, tap, okay. Did what, what were some good things that they told you and what were some things that they were probably missing? Um, telling me, I think the, the, the whole importance of, you know, resumes, things like LinkedIn, they covered a lot. Um, benefits, education, things like that. Um, what I felt they should have focused more on was things like uh, insurance. So, for example, you know, uh, you know, uh, SGLI goes up every five years. Okay. So by the time you're in your 60s, you're paying essentially hundreds of dollars, you know, for, for life insurance. So, you know, uh, they didn't bring that up. But one of my mentors told me, he said, hey, if you're going to do life insurance, do it, you know, before you hit 40. Okay. 39, I did a life insurance policy, you know, 30-year term at a real reduced cheap rate, which okay. is impossible to do right now. But these are things that they don't tell you that after you get out and you keep SGLI, what's going to wind up happening is, uh, every five years it goes up. So by the time you're 60, 65 years old, you're not even going to be able to afford SGLI. And you just paid for the 30 year, you just paid 30 years almost for nothing. Now it's going up. You're still alive and now the premium's gone up. Yeah. 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 So that I wish they would have covered. Um, the, the claims process, they really didn't get too deep into it, but that should be done six months out. Six months before, if, if you want to receive your your rating and compensation right at the same time when you retire, you at six months out is when you want to do it. But most of us seniors, officers, I, I really had a couple. I had a couple of officer mentors, but if you look at a full bird colonel that retires with with thirty years in, he's making double in retirement that. Or, yeah, or a warrant like a CW five, or yeah, like yeah, field grade yeah. officer. Yeah, they're making big money. Over colonels, um, I'm gonna tell you, they they make a lot of retirement. So I, most of them, you know, they already know. You know, look, I got enough in retirement. I can wait to do the claims process once I get out. You know, because once you get out, the claims process can take up to a year, and then you get back pay and things like that. Right. I didn't want that. I wanted to put everything in, and. When I retired 30 April 2021, May, retirement pay and, and the disability came in right there together. Did you start the six months before? Um, no. Well, at C, it, I, was, I was in that, in that fortunate position in, in the soft that um, when I passed the guide on in July, the group saw major basically said, hey, look, man, you're retiring with 32 years in. Take care of everything you need to take care of. Now, I didn't abuse it. You know, I told the the HAC first sergeant that that's who I fell under. And he's a he's a sergeant major right now, recently promoted. I told him, I said, look, anything like your analysis, still call me. If you need some help or something, call me. I'm going to come in twice a week to review. You know, so I did all that, even though people told me not to. Okay. You know, I did that. I still showed my face. I, I still did those kind of things. Um and uh, he gave me the time. I was able to appointments, you name it. Uh, uh, I was able to do everything that I needed 
you know, in the soft side. Now, the conventional army, no, I think they work you right up to six months. Or if they still have the <clears throat> 90. So you pass the guy on 90 days after that, you got to be out the army. Yeah, I was going to say on my behalf, um, I was at Carson for my last 11 months of the military, and they were just so worried about going to the field all the time. They didn't really care who was getting out the military. Uh, when it was my time to get out, I was NCO. They charged me to chapter two soldiers out that were on the overweight program. I had no mentors, man. I mean, it's part of my fault because I didn't do my own due diligence, but I didn't, like you said earlier, you don't know what you don't know, right? So it's like, you know, I'm looking around, I don't get, and then they said, hey, you got an appointment at the VA. I'm like, I'm not going to the VA. I don't even know what that's for. So I, when I, I didn't even, and that was during the last two weeks of clearing the whole base. So I, I was definitely set up for failure. I mean, I got out with 0%. I had plenty of stuff in my medical records as well, but, you know, not have like if I could go back, that's definitely something that you got to start like six months out. And I've always tried to help my friends now that are still in say, Hey, get that going now. But, um, you know, like, what would you tell someone that's still in the military, <clears throat> dependent, no matter if they're on soft or, or regular or reserves, like what would be your, one of your messages to them about just the claims process? Cause did you get out with a hundred percent? Yes. Well, see, I, I, uh, my last year in the battalion, um, I was injured in a parachute jump, broke my tailbone, herniated some discs in my back. Um, so the group saw major, because if I would have been in any other airborne unit and, and not been able to perform that duty, I would have been removed from position. Right. Uh, the group saw major, again, soft side, he would have been like, hey, check it out real quick. You're retiring after this, so stop your jump pay, and we're going to medically terminate you, because you can't jump any longer like this. And, uh, but I said, then I got to get out of position. Who says, don't worry about it. You keep on doing your job. You, you, you're doing awesome. You know, I mean? you don't, you don't have to be, yeah, there was green berets there that was saw major that weren't on jump status. But they were physically. Yeah. I mean, you've done it for 30 years. Like, like, come on now. Like your body's probably broken at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I had to do it in that organization. Cause you know, in your case, it, it, it was different. A lot of people got screwed over because it was a wartime on it. True. You know? And You're right. when it's a wartime army, things run at a different level, at a different speed. It's all about that war effort. So, yeah, things like transition fall by the wayside. But I can tell you that that as a first sergeant, what I used to do, as soon as a soldier hit a year out, hey, are you ETSing? Yes, yeah, I'm major. I'm your first sergeant. I'm ETSing. Okay, hey, check it out real quick. Stop jumping. Like, what? I don't have to jump anymore. I mean, you're ET why, why why keep you on jump status? You know, you're ETS in any way, you know, some guys, oh, you know, I'm who and all this other stuff and whatever, you know, so I would I would enforce things like ACAP. You know, I would tell the platoon, so I'm get used to him not being around. You know, but other units, you know, don't do that. And they, you're right, they will work you until the last minute. I know Sergeant Majors that they work, you know, CSM position. You know, that they work until the last minute before the no people. time for themselves, no time to take care of the transition out of the military. Once no. you pass that guide on, it just seems like, and, and then they expect you because you're senior with all these years in, it's like you're supposed to be used to this kind of thing. You know? And uh, so I tell anybody, you know, exit plan. If you're going to go past 20, that's when you really need to have your, your exit plan strategized. You know, things like, you know, finances, you know, a lot of my peers, you know, big house, big cars and, and all this other stuff. And all of a sudden now, here you are, you're going to retire. And if you retire at 20, that's 50 percent of your pay. Right. Why? Which isn't too much, right? Because base pay only. You're not getting the BAH, you're not getting all that. You're just getting the base pay. Yeah. So things like finances, you know, I. I what I wanted to do, I wasn't too short of, but I was real fortunate. You know, I retired CSM. You know, my, my wife retired as a CW4. So okay. financially, you know, we were there. So I knew I didn't have to jump back into the workforce because all my peers, if you look at, you know, LinkedIn accounts of retired, anything, you see them change so many jobs. Amazon for a year, this place for a year, that place for a year. It, it takes like three or four jobs for them to figure out which one. Right. 
It's because they don't give they don't give themselves uh I call it uh time to decompress. So okay. I knew that I wasn't gonna jump into the workforce real quick. Um, because at that time COVID hit and everything was flushing down the toilet as far as positions. So what I did was, you know, I post 9 11, my my son used it for a little bit, but he not not all. I still had three and a half years left. So I retired April 2020 and May 1st started grad school. And I jumped into that. I knew I needed something to occupy me mentally because when you go from 100 miles an hour to zero without an outlet, that's when you start thinking about, you know, like in my case, everything bad that ever happened to you in the military. You know, that's what's in your mind now. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah, you're right, though. You're right. Yeah, I knew that I didn't want to have those those thoughts and anger because a lot of people get out of this run. I, 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 I'm not this run. It was, it was, I mean, it was great to me and my family. Um, so I went to college. I, I did that. As a matter of fact, I just finished my last class uh, a couple of months back. Congratulations on that. So you didn't give you, you didn't even want, go right to the workforce and say, hey, I'm going straight to school. You had that I, planned out, which is a great plan because – like, that's I, I went through 12 jobs, man, or something like that. You do, like you just said, you try to find that fit. You're like, hey, I'm, I'm making good money in the military. You know, I was making 50000 50, as a sergeant, they be age, and then you get out and you can't get a job for $14. Or there's some people say, hey, you're overqualified. What does that even mean? You know, or you get these jobs and it's, like you said, you just don't find that fit. And then I did the same thing you did. I went to, I started going to school and then. I, I was in a financial bind, so I started applying for contracting jobs and pretty much deployed as a civilian again for like another two and a half years, you know, but that's just how the how the ball rolls, I guess, sometimes. But it seems like you definitely had your stuff mapped out and had a good plan, which is a vital. And a lot of it was just luck. I was fortunate that at 20, I made a decision to go past, but I still kept the exit plan in the back of my head. You know, this can end at any time. My wife did. Right. My wife did 31 and a half. So kind of same thing with her. When she hit 20, you know, it was like, okay, in the back that, you know, at any time I can either be put out or I can put in to get out. Right. So um, definitely keeps you on your toes as far as uh, what's out there, um, positions. Uh, you know, another thing that they don't cover in TAP, which, you know, well, they didn't cover it in ACAP. They covered it in the executive TAP. So, uh, and it happens to a lot of people. It happens a lot of seniors too. You know, all of a sudden, here's your last pay before you get out the army, your last check, and it's not there at the first. It's not going to be there at the first because you know the, the army has this audit process. Mine took ten days. You know, I did thirty-two years. Mine took ten days. So right. you thinking that your money is going to hit that account through USAA like it has every month on the first. And guess what? All of a sudden it's not there. Yeah. And if you had leave, if you had leave that you sold back, you got a fat check waiting at the end and you might be waiting on that thing for yeah. something and you might not get it yet. Yeah. So a lot of people all of a sudden now, holy smokes, you know, missing mortgages, car payments and all kinds of stuff. You know, So that's where the preparation came in where, okay, every month I know I need to put this aside and, and, and be ready because, my last check in the army is not going to hit that account. Maybe up to the tenth. Mine didn't 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 kick in until the tenth. Who can go to executive level taps? Is that like E eight and above? Well, I don't even think I, maybe the regular army does does do that, but this was a use of sock. Okay, it was a use of gotcha. executive tap. They did it on Eglin, so it was a joint type. You know, it was uh, E nines and above, mostly. You know, special operators um, from the Navy, Air Force, all of them. Okay. And uh, and then full bird colonels and above. We had a a few a few captains in the Navy, um, which is the O six, and I think we had like one admiral, um, and the rest were Air Force E nines, uh, command chief master sergeants, uh, and then, uh, you know Navy. Command chief petty officers, you know, okay. all the star majors from the army. Right. Okay, what? Uh, so when you got out and everything, you were going to school. How was how was school going for you? I mean, obviously you 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 got some degrees and stuff while you're in. Got your bachelor's degree, went to masters. But how how was that compared to like being in the military? For me, I had I had, I did it online. Most of my okay. majority of my college was online. I'm not really a classroom person. Okay. Um, 
you know, so I knew for a fact that I wasn't going to be in the classroom with a bunch of teenagers or 20s and low 20s. Because, you know, opinions are different. You know, I'm there. Right. Like, I'm not there for any social experiments or anything like that. Look, I'm here to get a degree. I, I want to learn my my chosen field in, you know, okay. in the program. So, you know, college nowadays has so many outside entities involved. I think that kind of distracts from that. So I did everything at home. Um, okay. So, and, you know, Excelsior, which is a school that I went to, and I'm not promoting them, but a lot of military do use that um, as a school. So uh, there was classmates in some of my online classes, a, a lot of military and, and a lot of civilians as well. Um, so was it difficult? Yeah, it's difficult. If you pick a career or you pick a program, like, you know, you hear people all, oh, I'm doing a, you know, master's in business administration, but I hate every class. I didn't. I, I chose a bachelor's degree in management, you know, with a concentration in organizational leadership, which is essentially what I did in the military. Okay. So I was able to equate a lot of the coursework with the military, I just had to kind of like turn it around a bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So wasn't that, it wasn't that bad of a transition then for the most part, plus you're getting paid. So it's like, that's the way I looked at school. It's like, you just go there, make sure you do, you do your job. It's not that, it's not that hard to do it. Right. You're getting your money, you're getting paid for it and you're learning at the same time. So people need to remember if, if uncle Sam is paying, you can't get below a B. Right. You can't get below. If you get a below a B, you failed. Right. Because I was in a class with one of my ex-soldiers from Fort Drum, you know, and I could see him doing like real minimum standards and some of the discussion posts and because you can see each other's things. You know, you can see right, right. And, uh, you know, I wrote him. I was like, hey, man, you, you know, you can't get below a B on this thing. If, if big Army's paying. You know, a grad school class is 2000 a pop. Yeah, minimum. That's, yeah. that's on a good day, right? Like, yeah. So I was able to, to, you know, that that's how I, uh, that's how I was able to to manage that. I retired and went straight into school. Something, you know, mentally stimulating to keep my mind occupied, so you don't start getting those, you know, the boogeyman thoughts. And because that can happen to anybody, you know, it doesn't matter what your uh, MOS is. Uh, the worst person that I ever saw in the military that had PTSD. Um, he, he flew UAVs. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, you're, you're doing, you're doing damage on things on that. So it, 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 it PTSD is not one of those things. You know, I, I don't really like the term PTSD myself because that, that could encompass anything. You know, if True. I could change it, Silva could change it, Orlando Silva could change it, it would be, you know, like it's, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. I would call it post-combat stress disorder. Okay. Because right now, if I fall down a flight of stairs, that can give me PTSD. Oh yeah, most definitely, man. It's it does. It's, that's just not connected to the military. That's the whole world, man. You get in a car accident, anything. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. What What did you struggle with though the most when you got out? I think with with me, and it wasn't even the whole identity thing. With with me, I think I struggled the most was with going from 100 miles an hour to zero. That's what kind of killed it for me, having this enormous amount of responsibility because the group support battalion was 600. So a lot of people in there, you know, going, go, going from a job that you're managing so many different entities, you know, people overseas, Jehovah's in Syria, Afghanistan, and then 7th Group has the Latin American mission. You know, so there's also people in Colombia, you know, all those Latin American countries. So, you know, being... Going from that, where you arrive to the office at 530, you have 30 emails, you know, and so many phone calls you got to respond to, two phones, a Blackberry, your own personal, and you're getting calls on both. Nonstop. So now you're going from that operational tempo to just like what I'm doing right now on a Saturday at 1130 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you probably, what time did you get up at? Like six? You yeah, still, you still up early? I'm up when the sun is up. You know, still haven't changed. Um, still do that. I'm still physical, you know. Um, and that's another thing that people don't realize also that 
you know, you go from being so active to unactive. You know, I retired, I was 194. I found myself last year, I was 220. You know, like, holy yeah. smoke. Never yeah. weighed that life. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I'm back in the gym now. I've lost a couple of times and, you know, feeling a whole lot better. All um, right. But if I could tell anybody, you know, what to really, really focus on, you know, and I'm going to talk about the retirees because, in my opinion, the retirees kind of get it worse. What happened to you, I don't think will ever happen again to any soldier. It might be happening, um, you know, in certain places in the Army, but on the major installations, I mean, they really, really clamped down on that kind of stuff. They know? needed to. I got out of 2015, so it's been a year. Yeah, they've had some time to do it, so I, I sure hope they are, man, because, I mean – you know, my experience, I guess I get to just add to my story, which is fine. But I know I was, that was definitely not the, I mean, left the sour taste in my mouth for a long time, you know. It, but, yeah. it will, you know, because well, you, really, you, you give all this time and it just seems like when you're no longer for them, it's like, okay, I'm going to cut your static line, get out of here. You know? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. That. That I don't think will, will, will occur. It might be occurring in, in smaller sentences or, or, or it might be occurring in one of those low dense, like, like in my case, I was a 44B. Um, in the whole 82nd, there was only one of me as a staff sergeant. There's only one, one slot in the, any division at that time for a 44B. Wow. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, I was low density if there ever was a low density. In a lot of places, I was low density. You know, so, yeah, things like school sometimes are difficult. You know, if I wanted to do college, you're going to do it on your own on the computer. Because I knew that my job was so low density, they were probably going to know or do it on Saturdays. You know, Saturdays. Right. You know. Um, but no, they, 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 they tightened up a whole lot um, uh, with that, especially for us, because we, we're the, I mean, for, for E9, for, for SAR majors and E9, we get so caught up in mission, mission, mission that we forget to take care of us. Yeah. I, I did that myself. You know, I did that. I put a lot of things off and, you know, oh, there'll be time to do it tomorrow. You know, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow doesn't come. Right. Yeah. So I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you were saying something about, what you're going to tell like people that are the retirees that I guess that are what, what the disconnect or what, what you want would let them know. Um, I, I'm not, in, they need to remember that if this still, if this still exists because I've been out for three years now, the whole P Corp plus 90, it's not enough time. People will tell you that it's enough time, but it's, it's not. Most of us, uh, if we came in in the late eighties, still have paper medical records somewhere. So yeah. from 1988 to 2004, I was missing that whole medical record. 2004 is when it went digital. So here I am calling for a drum because they said that, you know, we moved it from drum to brag and I'm calling for a brag. Oh, we moved it from brag to, so anyway, I found them in the tough box. Jeez. 1988 to 2004, I took it to my PA and had him disc it, he, he digitized it. Okay. Well, he put it on the disc for me, um, and 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 you know, same thing. Get your medical records on disc, and, and have that. I have mine saved on the computer. Uh, I have mine saved because when it went, once you pass the guide on, if it's still you know ninety days, peak corpus ninety, that's not enough time to try to find. You know, I was fortunate. I didn't really have a lot of PCSs. The, the preponderance of my career, 32, 21, 22 was on Fort Bragg. Okay. I kind of knew where all that was at. Um, you know, uh, if your organization, you know, as a star major, I always say, you know, if, if you have to be there every day for your organization to, to function, then you're ineffective. So, right. you know, as much as most of them don't want, they got to start pushing away at least a year out. You know, you already know in your organization your strengths and weaknesses. Like I knew who my good first songs were. I was fortunate because in SF, there is no company first on. It's company sergeant major. You know, there is no company commander as a captain. It's a major. 
you know, so I had two companies that fell under me that were SF companies that had actual E9 wearing company saw I made it. So I knew one, he fell in for me. You know, he's like, hey, dude, I got it. Don't worry about the CSM, you know, boom, boom, boom. He's a star major just like me. He may not have the CSM title. Right. The, the cracking of the whip is still the same. It doesn't. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, so he ran it. He he did me a solid. You know, whenever I had to do uh, different things, he, he would sit in for me and, uh, and, and so I could handle things and you know, things like medical records I had to find, um, paperwork that I had to look for and, you know, physical therapies, because it's not about the size of the medical record. It's about the size of the treatment. So everybody thinks you have to have a real big fat medical record. Right. Yeah. After 30 years, you'd be surprised how many E9s medical records are thin because they just never went, you know? So it's not about the size or how big your medical records are. Cause you can have the biggest, you can go and sit call a thousand times, but that just says you went. So, right. Like every time I was injured, I made sure that I did a physical therapy or treatment. Okay. Um, because what they do when you go through the process of the VA, what they do is everything that you can be, everything that you can claim per se, any injury, any possible bilateral, whatever they want to call it, they'll grab your medical records and control F that against the record itself on the CD. So that's how they did it for me. The lady, right. DSO, the DD, she grabbed my medical records on this and said, okay, bilateral, shoulder, whatever. And she found it on the disc. Holy smoke. You went on sick call five, six times for this. Each time you did physical therapy, you know. And that's how they, they put it all together and package it to turn it into the claim. Um, so being able to have those accessible is, is real important. You'd be surprised how many of us don't. No, so you're right, because wasn't there a fire back in the day for one of the places they had medical records? I forget what camp it was at or base, but like, you're right. It just, I mean, you know, as an NCO, we we got to keep uh, counseling packets. We got to do NCOER. You got to do all this stuff, but you got to do the same thing for yourself, right? Like, hey, keep make sure you keep all your records. But you're right. It's like you're almost programmed just to not even think about that. You're just worried about the mission at hand. Then when you get those 90 days or whatever, like you said, that's not enough. You know, so that and, and another another key ingredient that, that most forget about because the military does it for you, uh, like things like taxes. So when you retire, you get your ERAS. OK, um, if you go to a state that doesn't have any state taxes, that, that's fine and dandy. You're still going to have federal. Yes. And, and then, you know, the, the ERAS doesn't compute your pay based on your state and your tax bracket. You got to do that yourself. Okay. You know, so, oh yeah, I got a couple of peers, you know, that retired and, you know, and, and were told, okay, uh, the guy at finance said, okay, uh, I'll put down this exemption or whatever. And, and you didn't verify. And all of a sudden it's time to file for taxes. And they tell you, you owe 15,000. Imagine that. That's, yeah, that's going to be a good day. But, so they don't tell you that, especially seniors, um, because they didn't tell me. You know, I kind of figured it out when I made it to my final destination. I was like, okay, um, we pay state taxes. What's the percent? You know, and I kind of did the computation. They have a little spreadsheet online that you can get on there. But you have to figure that out and get on my pay on the ERAS and compute that yourself and put in additional payments. Most yeah, people, like you said, no one told you. So it's like, how you figuring that? How you figuring this thing out? No one told me that. I didn't know anything about that. Um, you know, so but it didn't really kind of break us off too bad compared to others. Yeah, well, that's that's good. Well, you were proactive rather than reactive, so you didn't really get stuck like that. Did you, did you struggle at all with like disconnect, like with like, I don't know, people, I mean, I feel like I've met some of my best friends in the military, but now we're all spread out all over the world. Like you can pick the phone up and call them and you like pick up, talk to them like, you know, like nothing ever happened, but at the same time you create this community and then everyone sort of goes their own way. Although you were at Bragg for a while. I mean, did you ever, did you feel like anything like that when you struggled? Did you struggle with anything like that once you got out? 
No, I I myself didn't. Um, okay, that's good. You know, that's in the in the military. I was I don't know. I was one of those people that even if I didn't like you, I got along with you because it was my duty to. For the sake of the army, you know, I'm from Brooklyn. You can be from wherever. I listen to this. You listen to that. I drink this. You drink that. You know, didn't matter because of the Most military. Definitely. You know, it was my duty to to you know. You're not going to get along with everybody. So, but, but for the military, I had to get along with you. Um, since I've been retired, there's there's uh, people that, yeah, I don't even talk to anymore. And, and if I never see them, I'll never miss them. Now, I do have a, a network of friends. There's eight of us. We were all together in the 82nd as E5s, E6s, E7s, E8s, you know. And uh, every day we send text messages back and forth and check on each other. And these are these are what I call my actual because I know a lot of people. You know, as a sergeant major, you're gonna know a lot of people, but oh, not definitely. All of them are your friends. Not all of them are your friends. Oh, um, definitely. So, and, and then you live in a glass house, and so you kind of be careful who you put in your circle. You know, so uh, it, it's definitely nerve wracking for me. It was nerve wracking. You know, so now I'm retired. Um, I don't really like a lot of uniforms. Where I live, there's not really a lot of uniform. My wife and I went to Fort Lee a couple of, I think last year, fall. And uh, it was during a week, it was a weekend. And we wanted to go to the PX, went into the PX, and I'm looking around, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> massive uniforms, and I just couldn't even enjoy myself. And I thought somebody recognized me, and I didn't want to so that's, the, that's PTSD right there, man. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> and, and it's not about the changes, you know. Because I don't really care. The army has to evolve. It's going right. to it evolve from the time I came in. You know, when I came in in '88, the Vietnam vets were still in full effect, and to us, well, to them, we were the weak generation. So right we're, well, now, we're, we're perpetuating that. We're doing the same thing now. All this woke, this woke, that. Look, the army's going to change. It has to. Um, so I don't get too involved with that anymore. I just, you know, uniforms. And as a matter of fact, I just drove to Rich, Richmond last week. I had two tough boxes full of Army gear. You know, there's not an Army Navy store here. I drove all the way up there and sold it to them. Yeah. You know, I just, it, not that I don't want to be associated with the military anymore, um, but that part of my life now is, is, is over. And, you know, it started when I was 17. So from 17 to... 50, 49, 50, I've, I've been somebody other than myself. Okay. You know, I was private, PFC, you know, and so forth and so on. So I haven't been to Orlando. A lot of people trip out. It's like, oh, it's not amazing. Hey, that ship is sale, guy. Orlando. Like, well, <laughs> I don't, it's not that I don't like being called that, but that's not me anymore. Right. You know, so all this soldier for life stuff, I, I was a soldier for life already. You know, you Most know. definitely, man. You were, yeah, you were. Yeah, I still have it in me, and I still like talking about it. I'm part of a real big network. That that's another thing. But for the emails out there, there are networks on LinkedIn. There are networks out there that assist, and one assisted me, and I've paid it forward. I've paid it forward to about five or six armies that I know, and it's a E9 and above, O6 and above network. Okay. And you name it, up to date info. I get emails by the dozens a week. And any changes from the VA, any changes in transitioning, um, resumes, you name it. I mean, that that was a godsend for me because you know what, what you think you knew really wasn't. Yeah, that's a bless. Yeah, that's definitely a blessing right there. I I'm just curious how why they just do it for E9s and above and they don't include the other people. Because there are networks like that for, for everybody else. This just happens to be one of those networks for E9 and O6s and above. Makes there, sense. Are, yeah. Yeah, there are other networks out there. Um, if you go on, I think is it. Look, look at how I find you, how I found you. Yeah, there's some, yeah, someone, I think someone, Tom posted, uh, I think one of my videos in the CSM. I was, I didn't even know it was a CSM group. I was, yeah, yeah. I thought he spelled something wrong because I was like, I didn't even think he was going to say a sergeant major group. So I was like, that was good. But yeah, they got veteran to veteran. Yeah, there's plenty, there is plenty of information out there. Just like, like you said, get on Facebook, get on Google, do a search, do the, like you were doing it 12 years before you got out. 
Yeah. That's a, I mean, you were, you were on top of it, man. Like you're like, I'm not going to let this hit me in my back. I'm going to make sure I'm ready to go because it can end at any time. And that's, anything I think that's, that's very important to know. Anything can happen. Once you hit past 20, it's like you're on borrowed time. You know, you can either get out by your own power or, or God forbid, mess something up and these guys tell you, hey, you got to be out of here in six months. Even six months is not really, you know, a, a, a lot of time. Um, I liked it when it was a year. You know. Yeah, that, that's that's about right. I always <clears throat> had the time I made when I had senior retiring a year out, drop it, you know, uh, if he's in position, if it was the first time, hey, who's in the, who, who's on the bench, use, get up here. Boom, pass that company guide on. Oh, I want to hope, no, you're not holding on to it. You're a year out, get your paperwork together. Cause you know, that's a process and we were in Florida. So it takes time for stuff to go from Florida to Fort Bragg and Fort Bragg to Florida. Right. Even, even through email, it takes that long, I don't know why, you know. So, all right. Hey, well, I appreciate you sharing everything, man. I feel like, you know, you're on, you're on, been on top of it. And like, you've probably helped a lot of people along the way. So I appreciate you. I, I, it's a pleasure to meet you. You know, we only met yesterday, but that's all it takes, man. It takes people like us that have been through it to try to give back because there's millions of people in the military, but there's only like one or 2% of the population that serves just, you know, there's a lot of people don't want to help themselves until it's too late. You know, they don't, they don't want to. Mike, I will tell you one of the things that before we, we end or, or go yeah. out of your way, people just need need to remove their heart and pride from the equation. Seriously, man. I had to do the same thing. That's that's seriously the key. Seriously. That's like, I I, I, I can't do it. You know, I mean, I'm a soldier for life. And there's nothing wrong with a soldier for life thing. I'm not. Right. It's just eventually you got to push back, remove your heart from the situation and, and take care of yourself and that's what privates everybody because you know you get you get those hardcore in your case was in for x amount of years and deployed three times right in a, in a short yeah window. three eight three deployments in eight years man i did a year 13 and a half and then eight months so it's like dude that's like almost half the time in yeah yeah and for the emails that are out there that see this because you are on the the, the star major page with this you know humble you gotta humble yourself, man. That that CSM, that title and position, when you hit these streets, nobody cares. It's gone. They don't even know. Some of them might not even know what it is. But and, and then they don't care, you know. It, Most it, definitely. So that that's one thing. If I could tell anybody, you know, remove your heart from the equation, humble yourself. You, you, you're not Big Willie anymore. You're just a number. And, Seriously, and, of, and it, you're not gonna get out with a million dollars waiting for you at the end of the rainbow either. Like that's what we we're talking about yesterday, and it's like. Who couldn't? Who wouldn't want to use a couple extra thousand dollars a month or an extra couple hundred dollars? It's something that you you've you've earned, or it's not even. I don't even know if you'd call it earned. It's something that you've you've gone to the ringer for, and it's it's a benefit there for you. You know what I mean? It's an entitlement, you know. Entitlement. There you go. You hear people, oh man, not gaming the system, right? In the system. You know, there's nothing wrong with you and blah. blah. Okay, you, you hear a lot of that. And I used to shut that down quickly. You know, I said that's good that you did that because I got friends that I got friends that still haven't gone. I one of my buddies, he didn't go to the for five years because he was from he's from Queens. He tried to go to NYPD. So he's like, I don't want to do that. I said, dude, they can't look at your medical record, man. That's that's a whole different thing. But we actually met up in uh, Key West Labor Day weekend last year with two of my buddies from Fort Campbell. And we made them do an intent to file. I said, dude, not, you're going to do it, man. Call, yeah. get the get the back pay rolling, man. And what happened a couple of months, weeks ago, he texted me and said, man, I just got $20,000 back pay, 100% permanent total off first first time. Make sure you let them know that that's taxable. Save half of it. Roger that. <laughs> Give me half of it. But nah, man, I, I appreciate you, Orlando. And hopefully we can we can help as many people as we can. If you ever want to jump back on here, no problem. If you got anything else, let me know, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm available anytime, Mike. You know, like I said, right now, I just finished school, so I'm trying to figure out what to do to entertain myself. So, you know, the number's the same, the the, the Facebook's the same, if anything, just, you know. And I'm still part of a network with active duties, E9s and active duty people. So periodically during the week, I get fresh info. You know. Okay. Well, even though I, I'm not 
there I'm still connected, you know, to the network and, and stay abreast of what's going on. Too easy, man. Well, hey, I, I appreciate you. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time, your service. Hope you have a good rest of your day. And uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. All righty, then. And you take care. Yes, sir. Thank you.